Hello, I am David Hansen, and as a UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. For those of you who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in a discussion with you, the local community of the Silicon Valley, and now, our extended community online, with the goal of making us all Renaissance women and men. We want it to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks. Mike, another volunteer organizer, is with me tonight. We're both alumni and spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. We'd like to thank our usual host, San Jose's Forager Tasting Room and Eatery for two years of support. Maybe, hopefully, we'll be there again soon. However, as with other restaurants and small business, they are struggling. If you feel so inclined, you can buy a gift certificate for the amount you would have spent tonight and use it at a future date. It would really help them out. We'll send instructions over social media. Well, tonight we're raising a virtual stein with Michael John, MJ, Associate Teaching Professor of Computational Media at UC Santa Cruz and Program Director of the Games and Playable Media Master of Science degree program. This program operates, at least in COVID-19 free times, out of our Santa Clara campus. He teaches courses in game design, game development, and game programming. MJ has a special interest in level design, creative development methodologies, and coding instructions for non-technical creatives. For more than 20 years prior to joining UC Santa Cruz, he worked in the commercial video games industry with such companies as Electronic Arts, Sony, and others and in the nonprofit educational games field as co-founder of Glass Lab. Now, following his talk, we'll take questions and you can submit those in the Zoom's Q&A box down at the bottom. We'll take all the answers at the end, but you needn't wait. You get to the top of the queue by submitting them earlier. This talk is being recorded, and in a few days, you'll be able to find it on UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lecture YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and follow up emails. Okay, does everybody have their sign? Hold it up. Great, I've got your slug, Professor. Professor MJ. All right, thanks so much, David. Let me go ahead and uh, share the screen. All right. <clears throat> okay. Whoops. All right. Um, hopefully, uh, you're all hearing me okay. Um, <clears throat> So this is a, a little um, thing I put together that I'm calling No Single Player Games. And it's a kind of a, a, a discussion of, a, I think, what's a myth about uh, video games and how they're played. And uh, in particular, about how um, communities really form around video games uh, such that it's almost, uh, almost true to say that there's not such a thing as a, as a single player game. Um, you just heard a little bit of my background and a little more formal sense from David. Um, this is kind of my timeline as a human being. Um, uh, actually, my, my timeline goes far farther back than this, but this would be the uh, video game version of my timeline um, <clears throat> where I started as a consumer uh, in the 1970s with the Atari. And then um, these are kind of some big milestones that I like to think of as being uh, important along the path of the development of video games. Um, spent a number of years, as you can see, as a developer of video games. 
and then since 2015 here at UC Santa Cruz as uh, an educator. And the thing that kind of got this all going for me uh, was looking at how people have engaged with video games uh, in the very particular time that we're in right now, and specifically the time where we're isolated at home due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this is some rather kind of maybe surprising numbers. Uh, this is year over year video game revenue in the United States uh, sourced by the NPD group, which is really the most reliable numbers that we get uh, to talk about the video game industry. And these are year over year increases uh, from April 19 to April 2020. And they're really quite large. Um, there's a lot of activity in the video games world. It's actually one of maybe the small collection of parts of the economy that has not suffered um, during the pandemic time. And just as a point of, uh, of comparison, uh, smartphone sales are way down, although that is uh, worldwide, not just US. And in an article that I found about this uh, in the Washington Post, uh, Michael Pachter, who's um, probably the best known Wall Street analyst uh, talking about video games, um, basically had this phrase, and the red emphasis is mine, um, so basically people have more time. They're bored, of course they're playing more video games. And so, um, sure, I'm sure that's part of it, but I think that in many ways this misses what's more valuable about video games. And, uh, and that is that we all have a desire to connect. Um, that desire is particularly poignant for us in a time when it's hard. And video games are actually a way which, in which we connect. Um, so, Part of that means tackling this myth. There's this myth, and you see it in photographs like the one you see on the right, <clears throat> that video games are the things that people do, especially young people, to isolate themselves. Uh, they don't interact with other people, you know, these kind of negative stereotypes. And while, of course, there is some extent to which it's true, um, by no means is it as true as implied in the source of this photograph, which was this article on Parents Magazine Online about uh, what's being called gaming disorder, um, basically suggesting that parents should keep an eye out for their kids getting into some kind of terrible difficulty from playing video games. Um, I'm sure that gaming disorder is real, it would be a type of addiction, uh, but it's not to say that that's the norm. So I'm gonna take three views of this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm calling it one is old, one is new, and I'm not sure if the third is oldish new or newish old. Uh, you'll have to let me know what you think on that. Um, but we'll start with the old, and that was to go all the way back to the beginning of what I'll call couch gaming. And couch gaming is actually a term of art in the video game field, uh, which, which means you're sitting on a couch and playing. And the contrast would be when you're playing on a computer, like a home computer, uh, which is not necessarily on the couch, usually wouldn't be. Um, there were actually systems that preceded the Atari video computer system, uh, but the Atari VCS, or it's often called the Atari 2600 that you see pictured, was the first to really have a lot of impact. Um, unfortunately, that impact crashed in 1983, um, so it had to get restarted in 1986 by this thing called the Nintendo Entertainment System. And so that's actually where I'm gonna focus is on the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, its immediate successor, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and then the um, Sega Genesis, or in Europe it was called the Sega Mega Drive, which was, uh, contemporary with the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And as noted, all three of these played through your television, and that's really what's, what made them stand apart. And in some ways, this uh, the stock photo that you see on the left has it closer than on the right in terms of how these games are really played. Um, although the stock photo does have something wrong, and people who look at this or who know <laughs> their old Super Nintendo are gonna be a little bugged by it, because I think that's uh, Super Mario Brothers in the background. And that's not a game that you play two people at the same time, despite what's shown in the photo. But we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, so I did a survey. I actually just uh, put together an online survey. Uh, it's not a scientific survey, just a, a people responded. And got about 50 responses. Um, about 48 of them were, were usable. And it was very interesting. And this was the main uh, thrust of the survey, which was when you were playing these um, older console games, um, what did you, how did you play? Were you playing uh, with other people? Were you playing by yourself? Uh, you know, these kind of questions. 
And I was happy to see that the majority of people said that at least some of the time um, they were playing with someone else. And in fact, 18%. So they were mostly playing with other people. And we did have one person who said they played always alone. And that person also told us I was an only child <laughs> and had never had to compete for the console at home. So that's an interesting kind of, kind of spin. Um, for everyone else, uh, which was 47 people, um, they were either uh, watching others or taking turns at least part of the time. So you might have um, a multiplayer game like a, uh, a fighting game or a racing game or a sports game where you're playing two at a time and that makes sense. But much of the time you're actually watching somebody else play. You're not playing yourself, you're watching someone else. Maybe you're taking turns, maybe you're giving the other person advice. Um, and this is a really common way of playing on the couch, turns out. And indeed, all 47 people said that at least some of the time, that's how they were, they were playing. I did note that actually two of these systems, when they bought them new, they came with two controllers in the box, which was um, particularly a Nintendo thing. Uh, Nintendo is a very, thinks of themselves as a very family or community oriented company. And uh, it doesn't surprise me that they would put two controllers in the box. On the other hand, when you do play Super Mario Brothers, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you do have to kind of take turns. What happens is you keep playing until one person dies and then the other person takes over. I had a free response section on the survey um, and this was very interesting and fun to read. Um, certainly when you ask a question like, how did you play video games when you were much, much younger than you are today? Uh, inevitably, you're gonna get quite a bit of nostalgia uh, uh, in terms of response. So none of that is surprising. But um, having asked the question in the context of did you play with other people, did you play at other people's homes, did you play at your own home, those kind of questions, um, really brought out a lot of specific types of memories for people. Um, my sister and I frequently played different games, but we would watch each other. Um, would play two-player Mario Brothers on NES at friend's house every chance we could get, which as I mentioned, means that they were taking turns. You were not playing um, both together at the same time. Uh, it was the only thing my brother and I really bonded over, um, that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> and it also includes situations that weren't, weren't great. Um, this was a response from one person um, who still feels the way that she was excluded, um, unfortunately, uh, when playing other people's at, at other people's homes uh, for, for being a girl. It's very unfortunate. So as I mentioned, that was the kind of looking at the old. I want to jump into something, something new, which is Animal Crossing. Um, if you haven't noticed, Animal Crossing has become a rather large factor in a lot of people's lives and homes these days, uh, certainly including uh, my own. Um, Animal Crossing actually first came into existence in 2001. It was a game released for the Nintendo GameCube. It's a purple device on the right. Um, but what we're talking about today and what everyone's talking about today is called Animal Crossing New Horizons, just released in 2020 uh, for the Nintendo Switch. Um, so what is Animal Crossing? If you're not familiar with it, you're in a uh, small village. Um, it's kind of on an island. There's a number of other residents who are all animals, thus Animal Crossing. Uh, you are meant to build your home there and expand your home and buy things and build things. Uh, and it's all managed, this economy is all managed by this character called uh, Tom Nook. So it's a, another animal, uh, he's actually a, a tanuki, is the animal that he is, which I, just when I was preparing this presentation, I realized that Tom Nook is basically a transliteration of tanuki. Um, the, I noticed here that uh, I called this a furusato, which is a typical village in Japan from a certain era. And the reason I know that the story is from watching this video from uh, Naomi Clark, who's a professor at uh, NYU. Uh, Naomi's a great person to just listen to talk about games. I just love listening to Naomi talk about games. And in particular, this video, which surfaced quite recently, um, where Naomi's talking about uh, how Animal Crossing is a reflection of a particular type um, of experience from Japanese culture, I think is really, really interesting. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it in great detail, but if you Google Naomi Clark Animal Crossing, you will probably find this video and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so what are you in Animal Crossing? You're a tourist, you're the only human in this island world that you've landed on. Um, you're setting up your house, you're buying things. There's me, that is me in my Animal Crossing world. 
with my really cool espresso machine that makes me very happy. Um, and it's very single player. You're very much sort of this isolated, only the only human in the world, except that it often isn't. Um, and this is where Animal Crossing is so fascinating to me. And I think is a lot of, when we look at why it got so popular right now in the time when we're so isolated, is the particular way in which it designed its social features and roll them out to players. So there's two ways you can actually interact with other people in Animal Crossing, um, the, in Animal Crossing New Horizons, I should say. The first is through this thing called a friend code. It's this very long, impossible to memorize, um, baffling code that uh, Nintendo has used this system for several generations now of hardware. If you share this code with another person, you can eventually become linked and then you get actually pretty, pretty um, unfettered access to the other person's Animal Crossing space through the friend code. However, most people don't use the friend code for very many folks. Instead, they use this thing called a dodo code. And what's a dodo code? <clears throat> the dodo code uh, happens when I, as the Animal Crossing player, come up to this employee of what else but dodo airlines. By the way, uh, if you have not played Animal Crossing, uh, the number of bad dad jokes in Animal Crossing is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, you talk to the dodo, it gives you a code, and at that point, anyone that you share this code with can come visit your island, and they don't need any other permission other than knowing that five, four or five digit uh, alphanumeric code. So it's fascinating. And in particular, the other player, you can go to their island, they can go to your island, but it's very limited what you can do, and a lot of what you can do is interact with the economy. And I'll talk about that for a second. So that you can go visit complete strangers. So this is actually a screen grab from me visiting a stranger's island uh, back in, I guess it was, looks like April 14th. Um, why was I visiting the stranger's island? Uh, it was to sell, or to, to sell my turnips, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, do note that uh, this is myself, several other complete strangers to me. All of us are carefully social distancing, uh, so we don't get too close on this person's island. I have no idea who the person was that we were visiting. Although if you do look in the corner here next to where it says 2.15 p.m., there are several objects on the ground. And those are, um, are gifts that, uh, that myself and these other guests would have left behind for the host, for the person that invited us to the island. So why were we there? Well, it was all about turnips. Um, turnips are a type of commodity uh, that is bought and sold in Animal Crossing. Uh, you buy them from this character called Daisy May. She comes by on Sundays and um, offers to sell you turnips. Uh, this particular screen grab, somebody was gonna buy some turnips for 91 bells. That's actually, that's a, that's a decent deal. Um, and you can buy as many turnips as you like, bells being the currency of the, of the game. So this person currently has, looks like 7,500 bells uh, in their pouch. So sure, go buy a bunch of turnips and you're going to then try to arbitrage the turnips by selling them at a higher price at some point later in the week, but the prices fluctuate. So it's hard to say exactly how it's gonna go. So it's a bit of a gamble. It's a bit of a gamble unless you form a turnip cartel. And <clears throat> by forming a turnip cartel and sharing your, uh, your prices, and you can see that the folks here check their prices twice a day very diligently, um, you can ensure that everyone in your cartel is able to get uh, a good deal for their turnips. And uh, they're in green here, uh, some, some good deals at 422, 524. Hopefully those people were, uh, were responsible and open to their turnip market for their other members of their cartel. Uh, I'm not sure if cartel is the word they would use, it's the word I use. Uh, but it's this really fascinating kind of social, uh, you, you know, you have to create, the, this is a spreadsheet that has to be created outside of the game. This is not part of the game for people to interact with something that's very important within the game. And oftentimes game uh, designers will call this the meta, or I'm working inside the meta space. Uh, uh, Animal Crossing also does some really, I'm just gonna start a video here. Uh, some other really, really interesting, uh, cool stuff. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm gonna just get up going for video. This actually, this particular video, is from a guy called Gary Witta. Gary is a, uh, a writer and also a game developer. And he apparently has been running a, a show inside Animal Crossing called Animal Talking. And in this particular clip, um, he's got uh, apparently Elijah Wood and Danny Trejo 
uh, both in his little Animal Crossing world. Um, they're talking over uh, Discord or Zoom or some other, uh, some other something. But, um, but he got him to jump up and dance around in Animal Crossing, and it's just absolutely remarkable. And this is all based on this, um, this kind of weak ties uh, type of sharing with the Dodo code that's really unlike what we usually think of as being a multiplayer game environment. And it's really, really fantastic. So that's Animal Crossing. It's this weak ties, um, lots of connection, single player game. Um, so now I'm going to go into the, the, so that's the old, the new, this is the new old or the old new, and uh, I'll have to see which, which is better. But it's called speed running. And if you haven't heard of speed running, well, it's just what it sounds like. You start playing a game and you try to finish it as fast as you possibly can. Um, what you see here is a video of Atari's Superman game, which is from, well, it would have been sometime in the 1970s. Uh, it was the first uh, game that I ever did a speed run of. Um, and what you see here is actually the world record run of Atari Superman, where uh, G. Sampson 35, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, beat the whole game in 51 seconds um, by kind of like going at angles through the corners of the screen, was able to get some pretty remarkable shortcuts. So that's a speed run. That's a kind of classic case of a speed run. Not a particularly popular game for speed running, but it's the first one I ever tried. My particular connection to this speed running community um, has to do with the fact that uh, the first uh, three games that you see on this page um, are three games that I worked on when I was a much younger person about 20 years ago uh, called Spyro the Dragon. Um, Spyro the Dragon is a uh, what we call a character-based 3D platformer. It's a little dragon character that runs around the world and collects a lot of gems um, and has turned out to be uh, something that's quite enduring uh, particularly for people that do speed runs, that try to finish it as quickly as they can. And it takes uh, as much as several hours to, to, to finish these games, even when you're doing it as fast as you possibly can. So th the first three games on the list, which have actually gotten quite a bit of plays, as you can see here, um, are the games that I actually worked on and did a lot of the design work on. Um, and the numbers that you see, 1,905, et cetera, that's how many recorded runs have been submitted to this website. Um, as sort of official going for high scores uh, in Spire of the Dragon. So um, I was very curious to learn more when I realized that people were playing a game that I was connected to. Um, and I first watched uh, one of these uh, speed runs in 20, 2018, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So the first thing you, know, you might say when you see a speed run, the first thing I thought is, well, this is some kind of a sport. Is it like esports? Uh, it's got there are competitions, uh, they're keeping track of records, world records, that kind of thing. Uh, it appears that there are rules, and certainly there are a lot of people watching. I was one of the people watching. And the answer is in sport, well, only sort of. Um, you know, Esports really do uh, come across as a sport. Uh, speed running, kind of, and I'll talk about how. Um, yes, they do keep track, the people who are doing these speed runs keep track of their records, and they keep track of them like, very diligently. Um, Super Mario 64 uh, appears to be the most frequently speedrun game in the current environment. Um, it's fascinating that only just a few days ago, uh, a new speed record was set on the 70 star run of Super Mario 64. Um, and uh, I'll talk in a second about what that means when I say a 70 star run. But they keep very close t track of these. Uh, you have to have done it on video. It has to be verified, that kind of thing. Um, there are, as I was just mentioning, rules. Uh, each game, because each game is a little bit esoteric, it's going to have its own rule set. Um, so this would be the rule set for a particular category of uh, completion for Super Mario Galaxy, a different uh, Mario game that's still also very popular for speedrunning. Um, and you, know, you can read through the particular goals there. It also has fans. There are uh, two big con uh, meetups or events every year called Games Done Quick, um, in which people come together to watch speedrunners do their thing. This is a photograph from one of the recent uh, GDQ events. Um, they're held usually one in the Washington DC area and one in the Midwest of the US. Um, and they get about 2,000 people at each event. So that's uh, semi-annually, so 4,000 people a year attending in person 
to watch speed running and to do speed running. And it's, uh, that's, that's a pretty decent number. It's also streamed on Twitch TV. Um, if you're not aware uh, of what Twitch is, Twitch is a um, kind of a broadcast platform, um, a little bit like Netflix, um, where people uh, do things live and you're watching them do things live. So it's unlike Netflix in that way. Um, and the majority of content that's on Twitch is people playing video games and other people watching those people play video games. So this is the analytics uh, from a thing called Twitch Tracker for the Games Done Quick channel. Uh, it has these big spikes, as you'd expect, uh, uh, twice a year when they do their events. Uh, mostly pretty quiet outside of that. What I would kind of point out is that these numbers are actually pretty big. So uh, at the most recent event in January of 2020 on Sunday, so it's a, a I think three or four day event, um, the average number of viewers that were watching it on Twitch TV at any given moment throughout that Sunday was uh, about 215,000. So it's not the Super Bowl, but it's quite a few people watching uh, at that moment. All that being said, you're going to hear my argument that speedrunning is actually less of a sport and more of a community. Um, and to kind of dig into this further, I interviewed three of the top speedrunners from, from the Spyro universe. Um, one is called Chris LBC. And by the way, all these people go by online handles. Um, I do not know their real names. Um, didn't ask. Uh, I think that would have been a, actually a violation of protocol. But, um, but they go by their, their online handles. Um, <clears throat> Chris, Chris LBC is the current world record holder of Spyro 1 any percent. Um, any percent means just getting to the end of the game, uh, not trying to complete it, every piece of it. Um, so the Spyro 1 any percent is the most prestigious uh, run in the world of Spyro and current world record holder is Chris. Um, I also spoke to a runner called Katie Lady, um, who's top 20 in a couple of different categories. Um, and then a third one called April Cakes, um, who is not one of the top speedrunners, but is somebody who's a, a big presence at the GDQ uh, events, and I, I kind of got to know about her from, from that. Um, one of the kind of cool things that happened right away is uh, right after our conversation, uh, Chris invited me to the Spyro speedrun Discord server. Discord is a kind of a, a chat, um, uh, both vocal and text chat uh, tool that a lot of game people use. Um, and uh, you, anyone can make a server, uh, it's free. And Chris invited me and uh, to my surprise, there are over uh, 1500 members in that server and about 400 online at the time I took this screen grab. So that, that's quite a lot. Um, when I asked Chris about the Discord server, um, he, uh, told me that he, he thinks about 10% of the people who are on it are actually people who speed run these games and the rest are just curious people and, and fans of speed running um, of the games, which is pretty cool. Um, when we dig into the rules, um, you know, I asked Chris uh, about, you know, how do you feel about the, the, the authorities uh, that manage the other events? So for example, I brought up Twin Galaxies. And if you've ever seen a movie called uh, King of Kong, uh, Twin Galaxies um, has a big role in that film. And it's, it's the, this, I guess, self-declared uh, um, authority for high scores on older coin-op video games. Um, basically, the speedrun community wants nothing to do with Twin Galaxies. Uh, they want nothing to do with the Guinness World uh, Book of World Records. Um, instead, it's entirely driven by the community. And so when you look at the, um, the rule sets that are made for each of these games, they're all done by a moderator uh, through community um, discussion and agreement uh, to determine what the rules are. And that's how things work. They, don't, they really reject the idea of some sort of authority, authority determining what the rules are. Um, when I would ask the runners about competition, like, you know, hey, isn't that game's done quick, it's a big event, isn't it like a competition? And they didn't even really deny it was a competition, they just sort of answered like, huh, that's a strange way of looking at it. Um, they don't really see these things as competitions. So, um, you know, Katie Lady had this, I think, really actually quite wonderful way of describing um, how she has kept speed running for so many years. Um, she's been doing it since uh, 2014. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm always trying to catch up with what I know I'm capable of, which I think is really, gosh, that's fantastic, right? And you can imagine why people would keep doing it. Um, you also hear a lot of, uh, you know, what's it like to, you know, compete with so-and-so so over times or whatever. And instead, um, people like Chris LBC will turn it around to, it's just such a pleasure to know that person and I so admire these things that they do. You know, they're inventive or, or innovative. Uh, <clears throat> I did find this, um, and I only found it more recently since I talked to them, which is unfortunate because uh, two of the people you see in this video are two of the people that I interviewed. Uh, this is something called the uh, International Spiral Grand Prix. I'm not quite sure who organizes it. Uh, this was from last year. Uh, they had 30 entrants. Uh, this was the finals, apparently, of that. And uh, uh, this is just a video of this. They do this four-way split screen, and they're, they're all trying to achieve a certain set of goals. And you don't hear any audio in this, uh, but uh, if you could, you would hear them while they are clearly technically competing, um, they're mostly laughing. And uh, it's like they, they have this wonderful sense of the absurdity of it, what it is that they're doing. Uh, it's just really a lot of fun. Um, so game's done quick. Uh, I did ask, ask more like, hey, you have these big events, they're watched by so many people, doesn't it feel like, like a sporting event, like a Super Bowl kind of thing? And um, really kind of not at all was the answer. It was much more like, as Chris mentioned here, it's like going to an anime convention. Everybody is a speedrunner or a fan. Um, and it's about meeting the people that you meet online, uh, eating with them and whatnot. And also Chris happened to tell me that he, uh, he met the person he's currently married to at an AGDQ event. Um, <clears throat> Speedrunners spend a lot of time on Twitch TV, uh, both watching and, and streaming. Uh, it's almost like the lifeblood of what they're doing. And, um, you know, when I was speaking with uh, April Cakes about you know, how did you get started? How did you get into this whole uh, world? Um, you know, she, very self-deprecating, I'm not very good. I'm sure she's phenomenally better than I would ever be. Um, but I'm good at watching runs. You watch the runs a lot, you make friends with them. And you know, there's this sense of, and you know, Katie Lady was also mentioning the personalities of the people. Um, you know, it's not just watching a person do a run, it's watching how they do it and how they talk while they're doing it. And then you're chatting back and forth with them through a text chat, chat and, um, and it's really like growing a friendship and, and very much these people feel like they're growing friendships with the other people who are doing speed runs. They also have a shared language, which I just love. Um, I think anytime when you're building a community, inevitably you start to build shared language, like a dialect or a patois. Um, this is one of the particular bits of Spyro language. Um, it's called doing a proxy, um, which means you sort of bounce into a small, one of these little small enemies. And if you hit it just right and do all the right things with your fingers, you go popping way, way up into the air in a way that the game was certainly never designed to do. Uh, and you're able to skip around a lot of things. So this particular one that, that Saboom here is about to do, that skips a tremendous amount of that level. But, you know, I guess uh, power to him. Um, also, this is, so Saboom, by the way, is one of the uh, speedrunners who's thought of as being one of the most innovative and important in the community. And he has a whole collection of tutorials so you can watch to learn these particular moves. And he's narrating them uh, and, uh, and showing his hands, showing the video as well. Um, sometimes maybe people find a particular route or a uh, skip. And because they found it themselves, they like to name it. And the community will honor that. So this was a thing that was found by a speedrunner called, he called himself Stone Knot. Um, Stone Knot found a way to, just a second, whoop go like that, <laughs> right up that ramp. And uh, it was not ever designed to be a ramp. Um, again, I can, I can say that with some confidence, but uh, Stone Knot found a way to use it as a ramp and to get up into this location far quicker than you would under the normal path. And so that's now called the Stone Knot Skip. Um, I did try to ask Chris, like, have you, you know, do people name things after you? He's very, very humble about it. Um, he did mention there's a spot where you kill two turtles at the same time and people say you got the Chris and I guess that he feels pretty, pretty gratified by that. Um, as I was hearing all this, I actually was reminded of uh, 
a movie I saw recently called Free Solo, um, and some of you might have seen it. And uh, this is a climber, a uh, free climber called Alex Honnold, and the movie is all about him doing a particular route up the uh, El Capitan. And as he was planning this route and as they're documenting it, they're showing all these moves and locations on the route that have names. So you see half dollar, mammoth terraces, heart ledges, lung ledge, um, the famous boulder problem. Uh, uh, the way that language has developed, and there's also generic moves that you do uh, that have names, that's all very similar, in fact, to the way speedrunners talk and the way that they have developed a common shared language. And uh, in many ways, the communities seem quite, quite similar when I think about it. It's kind of competitive, but mostly not competitive. And it's about creating this shared experience that makes, uh, makes the whole thing um, something you have in common. Um, they also love history. Uh, this is a, I'll just start the video, but it's a, a particular move that was discovered by a user called Tuval, who most uh, Spyro speedrunners agree is the, the most important person in the community in terms of having discovered a lot of moves. Uh, and uh, you actually get to skip multiple minutes worth of, of uh, game by, by doing this particular little skip. Uh, and let me just do the, it's, it's a pretty crazy move. Um, and as uh, Katie Lady was just telling me, uh, when Tuval discovered the gulp skip, it pretty much destroyed all existing records. So it's like this moment in history um, uh, amongst the community. Like, oh my gosh, remember when gulp skip was discovered in 2017? Bear in mind, in 2000, 2017, the game was 19 years old. So uh, it took a while. And really the last big thing I want to mention about speedrunners is, is the couch. So what's the couch? If you look at, at um, a speedrun uh, on, on Twitch, which the, the, the window that you see in the foreground here is actually a, a screen grab of a Twitch uh, stream from uh, a GDQ event. You've got the speedrunner in the front, and then behind the speedrunner are three people sitting on what looks like a couch, and the reason it looks like a couch is because it's a couch. And they're all on a stage in front of the crowd. And the people on the couch, they have a role, and their role is to basically narrate the event. Um, they're uh, saying, you know, this thing is about to come up. This is a really difficult move. Oh, this is so exciting. Uh, maybe describing how, how the speedrunner probably feels if they just messed up, uh, that kind of thing. They'll have some back and forth with the speedrunner, although the speedrunners tend to be very, very focused, uh, especially at the GDQ events. And I was speaking with Katie Lady about this, and she's a person who's been on the couch a number of times. And she said the first time that she did it, the couch was in the back of the room, kind of off to the side, uh, and kind of isolated away from the actual runner. And if you think about it, that really is just like you would have a sports broadcaster, play-by-play -play person, you know, kind of off the stage. They're not part of the show. But she said in the ensuing years, they moved the couch right up to uh, the position that you see right behind the, the runners and it's just so much better and it's just like you feel um, like you're really part of the of the experience in a way that's I guess quite special and I really love this picture. Um, speed running's hard. It's very uh, challenging. It makes the very very slight mistakes, really slight mistakes can have really big impacts and um, it's a lot of pressure on the person who happens to be doing it on stage with like, you know, as many as 200,000 people watching them. Um, and here you've got somebody, you know, I don't know if he's celebrating or if he's supporting failure or, you know, what, then it really doesn't matter. It's uh, connecting with the, with the runner as a friend and as a member of the community and saying, hey, yeah, we're all here with you together on the couch. And isn't this all familiar? <laughs> um, you know, the couch, like why would it be a couch? Why would it locate, be located right behind the player? And it's just like I was sitting right behind my little sister while she was working on that thing, or I was over at my friend's house sitting on their couch playing together, and it's really fascinating. Um, just on Saturday as I was, you know, doing a little bit of, of final preparation for this, um, I did go check in on one of the runners. Um, I, won't, I won't say which, but it's one of the 
the really kind of more prominent runners uh, in the in the scene. And just wanted to sort of you know check in in real time, see what was going on. And the character was just sitting there, not running or anything. And I I turned up the volume, and I was watching the chat window, and um, I realized that this person had just gone through a very bad breakup and was really really sad and. Uh, the friends, the compatriots on Twitch were saying a lot of, you know, you know, don't worry, you know, your life will be great, you'll be fine, you'll get through this, you know, all the those kind of things. And they're all saying it as if they were your group of friends in any context, uh, helping him through it. And eventually he did uh, kind of, I guess he went in more like into um, philosophical speedrunner mode and <laughs> was talking through some stuff. Uh, but got to got to doing some practicing, um, including uh, just coming up here in just a minute. Uh, as he's describing all of his thoughts about his future and what might happen next, and then just so casually does uh, is that. <laughs> Which, as one of the original game developers, is just so kind of you know alarming and amazing all at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so, just to kind of try to pull these things together, um, this is this is Twitch's overall viewership, and there's quite a notable thing that happened uh, about two months ago, which is that Twitch's viewership roughly doubled. And in many ways, this shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, a lot of people are binging Netflix, um, spending a lot of time consuming media of all types. And sure, a lot of people are watching Twitch that wouldn't have been watching Twitch before. And, and you know, if you just kind of measure it, it genuinely is uh, about double. But there's something else that happened, which is not only did Twitch viewers double, but Twitch streamers also doubled. The number of people who were, uh, online at any given moment during this period of isolation and pandemic um, has has doubled along with the viewers and um, the ratio in other words has stayed the same more or less and uh, so you know I think that there's this old way of looking things uh, you have more time you're bored you're sitting you're watching right this is sort of the Michael Pactor and again no offense to Michael he's a very smart analyst but um, there's more than that and the fact that so many people were online streaming, uh, being the person who's sharing their gameplay experience, um, I think says, frankly, more than the fact that people happen to be watching more. And if you just do the math, and you know, I don't have, uh, this is very, very raw data um, on Twitch, but the mean, uh, and the, I would like to know the median and I don't, um, but the mean viewer count for a Twitch channel at any given moment is about 20, a little bit 20 viewers. And that's, uh, again, that's a mean when you take into account that some Twitch personalities are exceptionally pop popular and might have a couple hundred thousand people watching them. The median is probably considerably lower than this. And you might say, well, that's a bummer. Or you might say, as I do, isn't that neat how people are connecting? And typically when I log into a Twitch stream of somebody speedrunning Spyro, they're never by themselves, but there's usually no more than 25 or 30 people there uh, and they're chatting they're hanging out they're being friends um, I did see that somebody something there's insider twitch stuff but uh, someone ended up getting about 600 concurrent viewers and just kind of freaked out uh, they didn't feel comfortable with it. and then lastly you could have maybe seen this in the little sort of twitch Chiron at the bottom of the screen but um, in this most recent Twitch, or, or sorry, GDQ, um, the Games Done Quick uh, Marathon, which is actually a charity marathon, raised quite a lot of money um, for, uh, for medical charities. And, and you can see that the upcoming one, which has been unsurprisingly made to be a purely online event, is going to benefit Doctors Without Borders. And you say, that's pretty cool. But in fact, SGDQ and GD... Uh, AGDQ from their very beginnings has been a charity event. It's never been a go collect a bunch of money event. Um, and you know, you can actually collect a decent amount of money, particularly through Twitch. Um, and in the most recent 
event in January 2020, um, they managed to raise $3.1 million for the Prevent Cancer Foundation. And that's, that's pretty great. And that's part of, it's like the ethos of the community as opposed to it being some sort of a, a business venture. So I've hopefully helped to make the case that uh, single player games are social even when they're single player. And you know that's almost just a nomenclature and not the real way that people play. Um, and even when we go back to the very beginning, um, it's really been like that. And now with internet and with things like Twitch, Discord, these other tools that people are using to connect to one another, um, it's even more so. And when you're thinking about something like speed running, um, thinking about something like how people are playing Animal Crossing, um, you know, there, it's this deep connectivity that we're building out of video games with each other, even if that's not the sort of uh, obvious design of the game experience. And <clears throat> this phrase community of interest is something that's always stuck with me. Um, the way I heard the phrase is actually that that's a part of the statute that California uses to define how redistricting is supposed to work. Uh, when you're drawing district lines for legislative representation, um, the commission is uh, required to use this thing, this notion called community of interest as one of its criteria. But it's something that really stuck with me. Like, what is a community of interest? It's not geographical. It's not necessarily demographic. It could be a lot of things. And in the case of things like video games and specific video games, or even playing a specific video game in a specific way, that can become its own community of interest in a way that people connect, in a way that people show that they care about each other, and maybe in a few cases that they even, uh, they even get married. So that's, uh, I'm wrapping up this talk. I did wanna give a quick shout out, um, again, speaking to the times, this is a different part of the times that we're in, um, but uh, if you happen to be a video game fan, um, a service called itch, itch.io, uh, which is a great place to just get a lot of interesting games. Uh, it's currently running this bundle. I grabbed this screen grab from uh, a few hours ago today, um, but it's called the Bundle for Race, Racial Justice and Equality. And um, pretty good, it's raised two and a half million dollars so far. Uh, you are allowed to buy it. It looks like you can buy it all for five dollars if you want. Although the way uh, these bundles work, you can spend more <laughs> if you want. Um, I certainly did give more money than that for this cause. You can see the average contribution is uh, eleven dollars and forty-four cents. Um, one of the uh, gaming websites earlier today was referring to this as the best deal in the history of video games, um, and they might be right. Uh, one of the things you'd notice, perhaps, is that. There's 743 games that you get for your donation here. So just a little quick shout out. I'm gonna have the, the um, uh, URL is here on this page as well, which I'll leave up if anybody wants to copy it down. Um, but yeah, uh, please take good care of yourself. Whatever your community of interest might be, I hope that, it, that uh, it's something that you can be a part of. And uh, if it's video games, you know, bless you. So thanks. So uh, now we'll we'll open this up to Q and A from everybody. Uh, thank you so much, MJ. My name is Mike Reepy. I'm one of the co-hosts with David. I'd also like you to welcome you here tonight. Um, and you can ask. Uh, just a reminder: you can ask questions by typing them into the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, but maybe I'll I'll start us out with one, uh, MJ. I've been curious about. Uh, um, maybe it's a little word about some of the intentionally multiplayer games. Uh, I read something recently that uh, uh, a lot of UC campuses, like at UC Berkeley, the, the, uh, some students had made a completely virtual copy of UC Berkeley inside Minecraft. Right. An interesting, maybe, symptom of the COVID crisis. Uh, so just like thoughts on, on things like that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Minecraft is such a f fascinating tool. Um, you know, you, you can make anything you can imagine being made out of cubes, you can make it in Minecraft. And uh, yeah, I understand that the, the model of the Berkeley campus is, is quite accurate and complete. And yeah, you can, um, you can imagine, right? Now we're separated from each other, whether we want it to be or not. And 
the ability to come into a shared space, which in the case of Minecraft, it really is a shared space. It feels like a shared virtual space um, and, and be there. And, and I actually read some of the um, accounts that people were talking about what it was like and, oh, you know, I miss this part of campus or I miss that. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a neat thing, right? And it's, it's, a, um, it's using these games and their technology and how they work to connect with one another. It's just, it, it's such a huge part of what games always have been, but really very openly are now. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we have uh, so we have some uh, questions coming in. Um, uh, I've got the first question here from from Robert. Uh, what was your first reaction when someone utilized Glitch uh, that you had never even considered in a game that you helped design? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. And actually, uh, Robert, if that's something you're interested in, um, IGN, the website IGN, is currently running a whole series of videos of having game developers watch speedrunners play their games. And the reactions are really fascinating. Um, some people are really uh, into it. So like the developers of Yuka and Laylee were kind of comparing the speedrunner to what they view as their own skills. Uh, some people are deeply offended, you know, um, like, oh my gosh, how could you do that? Um, uh, I guess I would say that when I first saw some of this stuff, um, I did feel troubled. Like, I wish I had done better. I wish I, uh, I wish I knew anybody was even going to try this <laughs> because at the time, you know, without a lot of internet 20 years ago, um, it was uh, not something that I just even gave a lot of thought to or that my colleagues gave a lot of thought to. Um, but uh, after watching a number of speed runs, um, and especially, of course, after talking to the people who do it, I feel very differently. They, um, uh, they really view it and, and I said this actually when I was speaking with, with, with one of them, with Katie Lady, that I feel like once uh, an artifact like a video game has been made and it's been put out into the world, um, actually the next day it ceases to be the property of the creator. And it's then the property of the players. It's the property of the fans. It's the property of the speedrunners. And when they find something like that, they don't think that they're doing any sort of violation or violence to the creative work. They feel that they're discovering something in a world. And I think that they absolutely deserve to do that. And it's like, it's much more of a, a flattering thing ultimately than it is a, an upsetting thing. This leads into a question from uh, Batu. So I'm very interested in how people learn how to play games, tutorials, but it seems like most tutorials ignore the existence of other learners or players. Can you think of any systems that facilitate players learning from one another? Dark soul messages in question? Or do you okay. even think that that's a good idea? Oh man, that is a fantastic question. And, uh, and hey, Batu. Um, I mean, the first, the first answer I would give you is YouTube and the second answer I'll give you is Twitch. And that's really something that I feel like I've learned through this particular process, because if you think about, you know, I showed a couple of short videos of Saboom in particular, um, who's created these just, they're wonderful actual tutorials on how to do these weird moves. And, and he has this very calm voice and it's like, you can do this, just practice, just watch my fingers. This is how it works. Um, it's like, he's a fantastic teacher, right? And so you've got these human teachers um, that are more than interested in helping others within the, their community uh, through things like YouTube and Twitch. And um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've wondered the very same thing uh, that Batsu was asking. Um, and in fact, I even did, when I was working at Electronic Arts, um, did kind of a, a bunch of thought projects with some designers from sports games because the sports games have a lot of tutorial uh, problems uh, to get people to discover the features of those games. And um, I think now I would give a very different answer. I would just say, figure out how to get the community involved and let, the, let that take care of itself. Excellent. So Nicholas asked, I've heard that many publishers and developers are preparing for all sorts of shocks when people start to return to their normal lives. 
whether it be economically or technologically. Do you have any comments or predictions on what the impact will be on companies like Twitch in coming months? I don't. I don't have any particular insight insight on the, into that. I mean, what's what I'm amazed by is the extent to which, like you saw those, those statistics. Um, Twitch is a pretty high bandwidth service and their demands doubled almost overnight. And um, the fact that it still works um, is kind of amazing, right? It's this real testament to how, how scalable um, cloud technologies have become, uh, I guess. Uh, as far as how they're going to deal with, you know, game publishing and whatnot when things come back, um, I guess they, there will be a lot more remote work. Uh, and I think that's true across a wide variety of industries where that's possible. But I don't have any a special uh, insight into how specifically their businesses are going to be impacted. So I, I'd like to hop in. Oh, no, we have Jeremy. Thank you, MJ. How do you think colleges can help make community gaming more accessible for on and off campus students? We're considering getting a Minecraft server, encouraging people to view GDQ, and we usually run Smash tourneys, but so many games require every user to own a copy of the game yeah. or console. We're struggling to find ways to offset the costs so more students can participate who otherwise would not be able to. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, certainly, I would say that cloud gaming is possibly, you know, something that could answer that in the long term. It doesn't necessarily mean that the companies are going to give it to you to use for free, but at, the, at least they would have the ability to sort of turn the switch and then you could just use it as a cloud experience. Um, you know, Minecraft is is probably a really good example um, of something that you can do together. But you know, if you just make, uh, you know, I'm trying to say, oh, just make a Twitch channel. But but you know, the the question was was what about the fact that everyone has to own the games? And they're exactly right. Um, I mean, I, I guess I can suggest, <laughs> and this is a very uh, very poor answer, um, but you know, what I've done with uh, with, our, with the students in my programs this year is we've just, as we've all been isolated from each other, um, whereas we're used to, we're very accustomed to being in, in close quarters, um, is we've focused on making multiplayer online games uh, and, and using those technologies that are now actually, they're free and they're not that difficult to use to make our own online experiences. Now that's a bad answer because it requires a pretty high level of skill. Uh, that not everyone's going to have and a lot of high level of experience. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a, a nice question. It's, it's asking like, what are some of the more community oriented online experiences we can create that don't require all of these upfront purchases of your particular game? Um, it would be, it would be nice to see more, more work in that direction. Um, as it is now, you know, people can play Minecraft, they can play World of Warcraft, but if you don't have those uh, those games, then, then you can't. And that's true. So MJ, we have a question next. This is actually from one of our uh, co-hosts' kids who are watching. I don't know how old they are, but okay. I don't know why are Respawn Entertainment servers so buggy? So buggy? I've got no idea. I've got no insight. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Although, from what I understand from game fans, all games, all servers, and all services are terrible, and that's just their sort of blanket opinion, and um, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how actionable that is. Well, do you, do you share the observation that uh, Respawn in particular is buggy? I don't play a lot of uh, their games lately, so I can't say. <laughs> uh, well, we'll get but back I, to you. Know, in, in their defense, um, if their servers are buggy, uh, you know, that thing I was mentioning, um, and I've been hearing this from, from my, my friends and, and colleagues who are still in the industry, um, the numbers you see there for Twitch are mirrored in a lot of other online games. They're taking on gigantic increases in volume, um, and it's not easy to scale that. You know, elastic scaling works great for a website and is really hard to do for a video game. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
I'll, I'll defend them in absence of knowledge that they've probably been seeing tremendous growth in usage uh, and, um, and what they try to do is difficult. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I know web, web scaling is difficult in any field. So um, cheers, uh, and I have a next question from uh, Robert again. How quickly do you think esports will become popular in the mainstream? Things like StarCraft and League of Legends are complicated, but games like Rocket League or simpler physics-based games might be more appealing to broader audiences. To broader audiences. I mean, esports are already quite popular. Um, and it's been interesting to me, given where I uh, spent some of my time, which was at Electronic Arts, as I was mentioning a moment ago, and esports started to get like really popular. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that means probably FIFA soccer will be a big esports game. And, you know, it's not, it's not zero, but boy, it's no League of Legends, right? It's no uh, Dota. So um, what defines the games that become popular in esports is not the same thing that defines what's popular in physical sports. Uh, and, um, you know, honestly, esports have been hit a lot by the pandemic because a lot of what esports do does is in fact in-person events. Um, so like the uh, Dota Internationals in Seattle and the League of Legends events that they hold in, in Los Angeles, um, they can't hold those events and those get, get thousands and thousands of people in in-person attendance. So it's funny how in a way esports has taken a bigger hit than a lot of the rest of the video game industry because it's so focused on in person. Um, so I, my prediction, and this is just a prediction, is that uh, esports will grow a lot organically within the current type of games, the StarCrafty, you know, uh, MOBA type games. Um, Rocket League is an interesting, uh, interesting case because um, Rocket League is super popular. It's really fun. It's really easy to understand. It's basically soccer with cars. Um, but for some reason, like games like that don't catch on in the same way. And I'll make an argument for why. Um, if I can just keep going on and on for a bit. Um, one of the big things that people pay attention to in things like League of Legends and things like Dota is the fact that the games are constantly being changed by the developers or Overwatch. Um, you know, little numbers are being tweaked or a new hero is being introduced or, you know, things get, get changed around. And when that happens, the strategies of the game shift a little bit. And this is known and people know this is something that's coming. And it's actually referred to in the community as the meta. So, oh, what's changed in the meta uh, on League of Legends recently? And that level of complexity drives the whole sort of sports talk universe of esports to some extent. And so if you don't have that level of complexity, and Rocket League is very simple, it's a little bit hard to imagine that it'll have that same stickiness outside of the event itself, where people are chatting about it, where there's shows about it that people are watching that are just talking head shows, um, which you do have for things like me. So, um, I think that the depth that you see in those other experiences has a lot to do with why they have this enduring popularity. Excellent. Parth notes that in some cultures, video games are still considered a bad thing. She wonders how that might be changed. How might it be changed? Um, the typical way it's been changed is for um, people who play video games to get older and become parents. Uh, so it's a generational shift. Um, uh, you know, if you're talking about in, in some other cultures, and I, I'm certainly very, very well aware of particularly some Asian cultures where this is a big uh, point of conversation. Um, maybe if people had a little bit more of the message about uh, the social impact that could be positive, especially in times like these when we are isolated from one another physically, uh, maybe that would help, right? Maybe that would help to send uh, a little message. You know, I showed that that graphic from Parents Magazine. It's not just other places where this kind of sense of worry you know, is, is, is very um, tangible. Um, most of the time when kids are playing games or people are playing games, they're doing it to connect with other people at least somewhat. Um, not exclusively, 
Um, frankly, I think you know, people playing solitaire is probably the most common form of, of not connecting through video games, which is usually not kids. Um, I, I don't know if that's helpful or not to part, but um, when you understand that this was part of someone's community of interest, it's part of what they use to generate shared culture. Um, I think it's a lot harder to see it as this kind of inherently harmful thing. Excellent. So now we're going to go the, to the game developers who are listening. And Zach <laughs> wonders, what message do you want them to take? Or a couple of messages. Would you want them to take from this talk and into their work? Or game developers, what would you like? To, what would I like them to take into their work? Um, I am surprised by how little um, it seems that that a, a lot of game developers are engaging with their fan bases, um, and I see that in these IGN videos that I was referencing. Um, uh, you know, I've seen it in other games. You know, that maybe I won't name, uh, where they've done let's say and some of the speedrunners told me these stories like such and such a game and they gave me specific examples um hey the game was great for speedrunners and then they patched it right they did a, a a live hot fix on the software and made it so it can't be speed run properly anymore and it's not fun anymore and they stopped playing it and i think you know well who wasn't paying attention <laughs> uh to what's going on out there uh because you shouldn't have done that right you shouldn't have or when you did you should have caught you know, the, the, the message um, that you, I guess, like I was saying, once it goes out in the world and it's, it's becomes a possession of others, that doesn't mean they, they stop relying on you. Um, especially now that we do all these hot fixes and patches uh, of games. Um, I don't want to say that that's true of every developer. And there's obviously tons and tons of developers who, frankly, the more successful ones, I think are very engaged with their communities. Um, but the way in which they do it is is like that's a big part of the present. Uh, it it was um, it was not part of the world that I was making games in twenty years ago. Uh, we made a game and we kind of like sent it out there and we hoped it was good. Um, eventually, people started making these things called websites about it that seemed to be good, but we didn't have that that feedback loop that you get now. Um, and you can get in a way that's much, uh, much tighter. Um, that being said, um, though there are probably some game developers out there cringing right now because of the extent to which people can be extremely negative uh, in their feedback to a developer. And that's a genuine challenge of, I'll, I'll be honest, maintaining your mental health while trying to engage with the full, full collection, full spectrum of the audience uh, can be very challenging. Um, but I hope that if you find the right kind of communities and the speedrunning community is one of these communities, you know, I've found anecdotes where they just really forcibly eject from the community people who are using these toxic behaviors that we've become so familiar with online. Um, those are the communities maybe that you can engage with um, to, to, to keep track of how your stuff is being received and, and played and loved. Super. I'm going to slip in with one of my own. So I'm, I'm a little at a loss at wondering whether it's necessary, given the fact that communities build a community, whether it's originally designed as a single player game or multiplayer game, how much one should plan the community aspects. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are there certain segments for which, whether it's split by age, gender, uh, I don't know, culture, where community is essential to breakthrough, more so than others. Uh, anything that struck you segment-wise as being special in terms of addressing community in advance? Um, I think this is one of the reasons why talking about Animal Crossing as an example is really helpful. Um, people don't, you know, there's all these other, like Nintendo did not create the uh, spreadsheet by which people share their turnip prices, right? That's that's something that's done completely organically, external to the product. Nintendo did not do that, and Nintendo shouldn't do that. 
because the community is going to figure out how to do that. Or maybe even some third party services some sort might figure out how to do it. But when they designed the game, they did design it to where the interactions were going to be rewarding. Um, if I can make these um, uh, you know, distant or loose connections, you know, this, we talk about these kind of different types of connections that people have in their social lives, that there will be something there for me um, that's worth doing. I can expand my social network. Um, but as far as the tools to make it happen, I think most game developers are not very good at that. <laughs> and it's not what they're kind of designed to do. Um, and uh, leaving that to, to the community itself is probably the right way to do it. It's more about making something that has, that has these rewarding experiences that come from connectivity. Well, I have a question from Sarah. Uh, what do you think contributes to single player game communities theoretically having an easier time maintaining a welcoming or non-toxic community? And I, and I wonder if this is in relation to some other like tech communities that are inf you know, infamous for being quite toxic. Um, this is some, an area where I think people have done some pretty good research that I'm not going to you know, be as, as versed in as I should be to answer the question. Um, I think the question kind of answers itself to some extent, which is um, for some reason within these experiences, within the context of these experiences, people get toxic. And I think there are, um, one of the questions is what type of experience is it? Uh, is it a, uh, is it a, an aggressive militaristic experience? which a lot of video games are, particularly the video games that we think of as, as classically multiplayer. Um, perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised when the behavior of folks in there, in those kind of environments is toxic. Uh, it doesn't mean that that should be excused by any stretch of imagination. Um, perhaps games that are kinder uh, in their emphasis would have less of that. Um, that's part of it. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing inherently kind or or, or aggressive about Twitter, per necessarily, uh, and yet people behave the way they behave. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I, perhaps the fact that w in the case of a single-player game developing a community like speedrunners do, um, you really have to do it yourself, and um, they tend to be then these self-policed communities. Um, that that makes them inherently more cooperative, friendly, um, fewer people trying to just see what they can get away with, uh, which is a lot of the, the behavior that you see in the others online communities. Uh, I mean, just from, um, you know, I, I have the, the Spyro Speedrun Discord server up in front of me and people are just being nice to each other, um, being helpful. Um, and perhaps, I don't know. Uh, I'll just I'll just put to, put to, put forth a quick theory uh, that has no backing, um, but I'll refer to the thing that that Katie lady said to me in our interview when she said that her experience of speedrunning is about challenging herself and about being um, the slightly better version of herself all the time, and um, perhaps that motive, that particular motivation that's common to the playing of single player games, just sometimes just can I get to the end, right? It's this huge challenge for yourself. Maybe puts people in a better mindset or a better frame of mind uh, to interact with other people when they're, when they're playing or after they're done playing. Uh, and a question from, from Jeremy. Do you see any differences in how social communities engage with one another uh, between platforms like ARG or VR? Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, so, so ARGs would be a very interesting thing to study. Uh, it's not something I've looked at very carefully. Um, let's see, VR. So there are some social VR um, experiences that you can have. Uh, uh, VR chat is one, Rec Room is another. Um, there have been 
within those spaces actually some pretty substantial uh, problems because in VR you can invade a person's physical space uh, almost as though you were doing so in person. And so that that is a particular challenge. Um, at the same time, you know, what I do know of those spaces is that they're mostly very, very friendly and, um, and quite dedicated to uh, you know, people connecting to one another. Um, there have been, within this game called Rec Room, um, uh, which actually one of our alums is a, one of the lead programmers there, um, they actually had some people get together and act out uh, uh, Hamlet, I think it was, a Shakespeare play, just in the space, in the game space. And they had an audience, <laughs> and they had a stage manager. Uh, and, you know, wherever you create a space that has the right kind of feelings and the right kind of uh, affordances, you know, you will get people um, coming together to create community and to do community things like that. Um, I'm not sure how connected that is necessarily to it being VR. Um, I think ARGs, which is the other example that was brought up, um, are inherently cooperative. And so that's probably a case where you would see people uh, behaving pretty well toward one another. Um, they certainly have to generate community. Uh, I, I, if, if the question asker hasn't, hasn't seen, there was a, an ARG from quite a long time ago called I Love Bees, um, which would ring, um, this tells you how long ago it was, it would ring pay phones <clears throat> anywhere in the United States. And you would get a message like this pay phone on this corner of this intersection in this town is gonna ring in 20 minutes. And so somehow the community had to communicate amongst themselves to make sure someone got to that payphone within the next 20 minutes so they could get the secret message. And the, the community was so powerful <laughs> and so uh, cooperative that they actually were able to do that pretty much anywhere in the United States. Um, so yeah, I guess there, I, there are some very nice case studies of how people develop communities around ARGGs as well. And a question from Jacob. Uh, he asks, uh, have these revelations laid out in your talk made a tangible impact in your curriculum around level design and similar topics today? And maybe I'll extend that and ask you if you're putting in Easter eggs in, in your levels. <laughs> uh, maybe not around level design so much, but um, I, th I think I mentioned this a minute ago in a different context. Uh, within the, the current, uh, progress of, of, our, of our degree programs um, is that the students are creating a series of uh, game prototypes based on prompts. And so the prompts are things like make a game that evokes a certain emotion and I'll assign you an emotion or uh, make a game that uh, uses this particular pattern of play. And uh, this quarter, while we're all separate, one of the assignments has been make a game that connects people to each other. And um, the games that came out of that assignment were, I, I think two things happened. One was the games themselves were, you know, some of them were failures because that's how games work. But most of them were just inspirational. They were so much fun to play. And so much, like, you know, games, games create a shared context. They create, uh, we're not just talking, because talking is actually hard. If you've got to talk about a context, it's hard. Um, we're playing and talking and that's such a different experience. And then the other thing I noticed is that the, the teams themselves, the groups of students worked in these exceptionally cooperative ways. And um, I think that having that idea of let's cooperate with one another when we're playing and maybe when we're practicing and playing our prototypes and making sure they work, um, perhaps made them a little bit, it made, made it easier for them to cooperate remotely which is you know so difficult um, as well, and uh, yeah, they created some things that I think were, in my view, really quite special uh, out of that particular project, and it had to do with connecting people. Well, thank you. I, I think that's a perfect segue into how I wanted to close this out a little bit. Um, I'll ask one final question, and we might have we might have time for one more if somebody wants to type it in, but. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, about your game design program. You didn't 
uh, talk about it too much. I know there's a huge amount of, of innovative stuff going on, all, you know, from, from work on serious games uh, 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 to a huge uh, amount of creative output. Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, yeah, I think we were chatting earlier and you said that uh, your students are just getting ready to do their, their three minute pitches. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be online, and I know you have some online events like the, um, you know, the competition at the end. Yeah, I'll give you a minute to kind of plug your program and plug your your online uh, online programs if uh, opportunities for people to dial in. Sure. Yeah. So our um, the, our programs occur in this building that you see. You know, Dave was mentioning in the beginning. This is the building in Santa Clara um, at uh, Bowers and Scott. Um, right now, no one's in there except some people that are doing some construction. Um, but uh, we do conduct these master's programs out of there. Uh, there are two of them that are dedicated to games. One of them is what we call games and playable media. Uh, that's six or seven years old now. It's for people that want to make games for entertainment primarily. And then a brand new program that we call Serious Games uh, that you also referenced, um, which is uh, for people that would like to make games that have um, you know, a, an external purpose to just being a game. So it might be education, it might be uh, healthcare. So we have two projects that are going to that are going to go forward into the next fall. One of each, uh, education and healthcare. Um, and that's uh, in some ways kind of the more exciting thing that's happening because it's uh, it's brand new. It's the only uh, serious games masters program in the U.S. for now, and um, uh, have had some really uh, you know as all. It, Working with these master students is always inspirational, uh, but having some of the serious game students come in and share their ideas has been particularly inspirational because um, they ha usually have they have big things they want to accomplish uh, with these games. Um, as far as events, uh, so uh, yeah, I mentioned to you a little earlier. Um, our, we close out our school year with what we call our green light event, um, where all of the games and playable media students. Uh, give a three-minute pitch where they have come up with a great idea. Usually they have some kind of a demo or something to back it up for what ought to be made in the coming quarters um, of their second year of the master's degree program. Um, and we have a kind of a blue ribbon panel jury that helps us to decide which should go forward coming from the video games world. Um, and we will broadcast that live on Twitch TV. So it's uh, twitch.tv slash UCSCGPM, um, 1 p.m. on Wednesday, day after tomorrow. Um, uh, so yeah, tune in, twitch.tv slash UCSCGPM. Um, the uh, three minute pitches will be live and you'll get to see how that how that goes down. Live this year over Zoom, uh, but, uh, but why not? Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, fantastic. And uh, I got, I've got one more question from the audience and then I'll close this out tonight. Kevin asks, do you plan on expanding the program to the main Santa Cruz campus anytime soon? And, and what about remote classes? Yeah, okay. So the first thing to say about the main Santa Cruz campus is there is so much game stuff being done in Santa Cruz already. Um, you know, UC Santa Cruz taken as a whole is got this unbelievable collection of, of great games uh, uh, academic programs. So there's two different undergraduate academic programs, one in the arts and one's in engineering. Um, there's our two programs in uh, Silicon Valley. There are uh, also, um, you know, sort of depending on how you count, two masters, two masters and one doctoral program um, that have games at least as part of their curriculum in in Santa Cruz. So there are uh, lots and lots of uh, games being made in Santa Cruz uh, every year. Um, the whole university, I have to say, is, is, is deeply invested in games <laughs> and game creation. Uh, I think it's one of the, for me, you know, this is, this is a second career for me and uh, I can't imagine, I genuinely can't imagine a better place to be uh, to do what I'm doing. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, uh, just, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight.
uh, and uh, in fact, you know, we, we find as we've gone virtual, our audience is actually grow growing. So, you know, thank you for everybody who, to, who tuned in. And I hope you're enjoying our, our tour of the UCSC campus, uh, one professor at a time. Uh, so uh, just a reminder for everybody, this talk has been recorded. It's going to be available uh, in a few days on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We're, we're also going to post a link in the follow-up email that you get from this. Uh, we'll put it out on social media. Um, so everybody, please extend your appreciation for MJ's talk tonight. Uh, you can add comments in the Q&A section. Uh, he'll have a chance to read those and get back to you if you like, or just thank him for being here. Uh, on, a, on another note, uh, you know, we want to, while we have your attention as, as alumni and friends, I want to note that uh, UCSC's Giving Day, which is normally in April, uh, was canceled this year because of the COVID crisis. But we do have a lot of students who are critically in need of support for uh, food and housing. Uh, they need things like laptops to connect to their online classes. UCSC has a fundraising drive and we're concentrating all of our fundraising in, in one thing. It's called COVID slug support campaign. Uh, and I'd encourage everyone to contribute to this fund. Uh, we'll be putting the, the URL in the email that we get to as well. But uh, uh, you know, all of this money goes straight to the students. Uh, incredibly good cause and, and badly needed. So another big round of thanks. Uh, this time I want to thank, thank the staff from alumni uh, engagement and special events, events offices who've uh, set up this webinar for us and, and staffed it and have given us a tremendous amount of help uh, behind the scenes. I want to thank uh, Cara, Haley, Diana, uh, Paulina, and Kristen. If everybody could join me in that. <laughs> Thanks, team. Uh, it, I think it's gone pretty flawlessly this time. Our next event, Monday, July 13th, uh, second Monday of the month, like always, we'll be featuring uh, Dr. Peter Weiss Penzias. Uh, he's going to be lecturing on his research that found evidence in mountain lions for mercury bioaccumulation through coastal fog. He's an internationally known researcher of mercury biochemistry with, according to his Google Scholar profile, over 2,500 citations. Last year, he launched a crowdfunding campaign titled Mercury in Our Fog, So What About Our Food? And he raised enough money to fund an undergraduate research scholarship for the collection and testing of foods from local farms in the fog belt. In 2019, he won the Clean Air Award from the Monterey Bay Resources District for his efforts to understand air pollution. Peter earned his PhD from the University of Washington in Chemistry in 1995 and has worked as a lecturer and researcher in the Department of Microbiology and Environmental Toxicology at UC Santa Cruz since 2009. So thank you for joining us this, this evening. We'll see you on July 13th for our next virtual event. Thanks everybody and goodbye. <laughs>